Christmas rush hour madness in the Big Apple. Yeah, so we'll take a left here. And Dr Tom Oxley, an Australian neurologist in New York, has managed to snare a cab. But he's got a lot more to be proud of than that. He's also grabbed the attention of the president. The US and Australia are funding research into a device that could someday allow people to control their prosthetics with their minds and without invasive brain surgery. It's called the Stentrode, a radical new device designed to turn thoughts into robotic actions for people who are paralyzed. I could be getting up on a robotic frame and walking around. The Stentrode is a endovascular brain machine interface. It is a electrode array built onto a self-expanding metal scaffold which is implanted into a blood vessel in the brain. When implanted into a blood vessel, this network of tiny electrodes can record your brain signals. We can feed that signal into an electronic device, such as a mouse on a computer screen or any type of robotic arm. And ultimately, we'd like to apply that to an exoskeleton. Technology that has the potential to transform the lives of our wounded warriors and others with disabilities. This is the story of a new technology that aspires to nothing less than helping paralyzed people walk again. It all started five years ago when Tom pitched the concept to DARPA. That's a US defense agency with a history of supporting high-tech ideas, including brain-machine interfaces. DARPA basically told me that's a good idea. No one in the group is currently trying to put an electrode up the blood vessels. We'll give you a million dollars to do that on the spot. And he said, you have to go home and find a team to do that. I like doing things that no one else has done before and that people say can't be done. You do the scoring, can you do it? Professor Terry O'Brien helped put together the Australian team whose job it was to turn the idea into reality. With Tom's idea of electrodes within a blood vessel, you needed to have people who could actually make the device, but also people who knew how to deliver devices into blood vessels and people who knew about how to actually interpret the recording information, the physiological information. I initially thought, wow, that's a great idea. And then maybe five or 10 seconds later thought, wow, the challenges are enormous. <laughs> and you also needed people who actually had experience with using animal models of, uh, of neurological diseases. And so that's at least four or five completely different uh, disciplines that we're going to be able to require to make this work. Nobody had any idea it would work, and that uh, is, you know, the excitement of science. You're trying something new that's never been tried before. They began with the engineering challenge of designing an intricate web of electrodes, wires and scaffold that could collapse into the one millimetre catheter they'd used to deploy it. It's a nickel titanium alloy that enables the, the metal to have you know, shape memory properties and, and super elasticity, which uh, allows it to be bent and crimped without fatigue. They also had to develop a new catheter system to reach the target area. We are going both further than we've gone before and through a more tortuous route than we've gone before. You've got to have something that's pushable. So if you can't push something, you'll never get around these really tight corners and that some of the tight corners are within bone so they're very tight to get around so you've got to have a solid system at that point but at the important end right up close to the um, small veins you have to have something extraordinarily soft and yet able to navigate to be turned around corners what we've had to do is combine numerous different size catheters to enable us to take the sharp turns and bends The only way to test their system was in a pre-clinical trial involving sheep. They hoped the results would answer their biggest questions. Could we even get a device through the bloodstream, uh, through the blood vessels into the part of the brain responsible for movement? So that was unknown. Would it be able to record a signal through the blood vessel wall? 
would those recordings be able to record over a long period of time and wouldn't deteriorate with time? And when we'd got a device there, would it be safe? Now, using thoughts to command computers and bionic limbs isn't new. Indeed, human trials have been carried out for more than a decade with impressive results. Mark Tonga became quadriplegic following a rugby injury in 2008. For him, modern technology provides access to the world today and a dream for the future. I've always said if you had to be injured with a severe physical impairment like myself, this would be probably the time to be to, to sustain an injury. We've seen people like Mark, who are paralysed from the neck down, hand themselves a beer for the first time in 13 years. <laughs> All right. Skull it, mate, skull it. There you go. <laughs> I'm not a drinker, by the way, so I wouldn't, really, wouldn't resonate with me. <laughs> or grab a big bite of chocolate. Hey, she got excited and the arm just jumped up. <laughs> and even reach out to a loved one. <laughs> Reaching out and touching my girlfriend for the first time and holding her hand. That was... That was my highlight. She brings a smile to my face. Because, you know, it's just the flexibility and the freedom. Uh, and I can relate to that guy because it's a sense of achievement and you know, being able to, you know, do something for yourself uh, you know, just it's, brings me close to tears, I guess, you know, because it's, you know, we're edging closer to a person like me um, clawing back uh, uh, some sort of freedom. It's not possible to get these results using electrodes that sit outside the skull. They're just too far away from the neural activity. The best results have been achieved by arrays of needle-like electrodes that penetrate the brain tissue. They've delivered dexterity like this, up to 10 degrees of freedom, but they don't tend to last. The problem with these devices is that although you get very good signals to start with, the brain sees these little needles as a foreign object. Scar tissue forms around these and the signal slowly disappears. Non-penetrating arrays of electrodes have also achieved good results. They're laid out either above or below the membrane that surrounds the brain, the dura. The team's aim is to build on the success of these implanted devices, but with a key difference. Current devices require craniotomy, which means major surgery, cutting part of the skull out. There are so many risks associated with craniotomy. It's such a, a major procedure compared to what we're talking about here. So our idea has been to avoid the need for open brain surgery by using the blood vessels to get into the areas of the brain that are information rich in terms of motor processing. All right. Hello. There you go. All right. <laughs> when a person initiates a movement or even imagines it in the case of paralysis, multiple areas of the brain act together. The way I like to think about neural signals and, and recording neural signals is, is to think of a football game where not much is going on. There's a hum around the crowd, but when someone kicks a goal, the whole crowd erupts. All the crowd synchronises and is, is yelling and shouting the same thing. And in a similar way, when you're thinking about performing an action, your brain synchronises and, and all the neurons um, align and, and send out a big signal that can be recorded. But each electrode can only eavesdrop on the electric field generated by a few thousand of these neurons. So the preferred place to listen in is the motor cortex. So there's a region that will control the foot, a region that will control the knee, the leg, hands and so on. And so when a person wants to do something, this area sort of coordinates that activity. It just happens that there is a very large vein running right along the top of the motor cortex. So 
We think the Venus system provides us with a natural avenue to achieve recordings very close to the motor cortex. But making use of that natural pathway into the brain needed to be first tested in animals. So, 20 able-bodied sheep were implanted with a stentrode. The quality of the signal recorded from their motor cortices was then analysed for over six months. What they found was the stentrode embedded itself into the blood vessel wall. It's possible just to see these little black dots which represent the electrodes on the stentrode. And there was no evidence of blood clotting that could cause a stroke. That is a risk when traditional stents are implanted to open up blood vessels. It's the result we obviously wanted. It's very exciting because it means that these devices could be put into patients and one would hope that the reaction would be similar in patients, which mean that, well, that they could be left there permanently without causing any risk of blockage of blood flow. Becoming embedded also brought the electrodes closer to the neurons, improving signal quality. The big white bright spot here is one of the electrodes and you can see that it's very close to the grey matter. So it really does move quite close to the brain. In fact, the quality of the signal was comparable to non-penetrating electrode arrays implanted through the skull. To actually take the next step and show that you can use that in reality to, um, to move bionic limbs requires the human trial. And that's scheduled for 2017. In the trial, Professor Peter Mitchell will implant stentrodes into three quadriplegic patients who are yet to be chosen. We have both the experimental work that's been done and some models that are similar to this to tell us that we should be able to get away with it, um, but it is very new. Tom and Nick are currently commercialising the device. And we're just going to sit the catheter just beyond the origin of the internal carotid. Tom is at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York learning the surgical skills required. Don't move, don't swallow, keep very still. Great job. Tom, I think these pictures are outstanding. Do one low mag view, make sure... He's supervised by Dr Jay Mocko, a world leader in the field of neurointervention. Their basic fundamental work of being able to put this device in real life large veins in the brain and record brain activity once they've done that and shown that can happen, now after that, it's just mechanics, it's engineering. All they, we already have devices that know how to translate those signals. We already have proof that people can control computers or robotic arms with thought if they're trained appropriately. And we already have devices to do that. All they gotta do now is put those pieces together. So I'm pretty optimistic. My hope for the technology is that we can help patients take some control back in their environment. That would be an amazing outcome for, for our team and for the patients we're trying to come up with a solution for. They sign me up. <laughs> sign me up. Where do I sign? I'll go. Listen up, trendsetters. Mark Tonga could be forgiven for being sceptical. After all, Catalyst first met him six years ago in a story on the promise of mind-controlled wheelchairs. My brain signals are directing the wheelchair around the room. But he remains positive. Hey, Sean. Hey, mate. I think one of the things that I've developed by uh, having a, an injury like this is for a lot of patience and a lot of thankfulness. I'm alive and any little thing that technology can give me to make my life accessible would be welcome. Uh, will be welcome. It's all a